Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Shatan Berry. I'm with Michigan PTA. Some of you know who I am. I'm really no one in particular, but um, this, is the, <laughs> this is something that I particularly love to talk about. My first question is going to be, how familiar are you all with Common Core? Pretty familiar with Common Core. Uh, kind of understand how we got Common Core and that thing. So I don't need to do a whole lot of about that. I am anti-bad school, period. No matter what type of school it is. Whether it's private, pro parochial, uh, public, charter. I'm against bad schools. So we need to get rid of bad schools and make sure that every child is receiving a quality education in their school. So the voucher issue will be another issue that will come back up here in Michigan. Um, Michigan PTA has helped defeat vouchers twice in the last 20 years here in Michigan. It will come back up. We're just waiting to see when it will come back up. And a lot of people, the, the, the people who are pro-voucher are pro-voucher because they say things like, this will afford every child an opportunity to receive a quality education, but that's not necessarily true. Because if they only, if that voucher is only for $8,000 and you want your child to go to Old Country Day, and Old Country Day is $12,000 tuition, plus uniforms, plus extracurricular, plus all of those things, a voucher doesn't cover travel. So as a parent, if you take that voucher, it's on you to figure out how your child gets back and forth to school. It's on you to pay all of those extra. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best thing possible. Would, charter schools are public schools. Charter, school, that, that, charter schools are public schools. They are 100% funded through public dollars, through tax dollars. They receive the same per pupil. So they're a public school. PTA supports public education, and charter schools are a part of the public education system. We're not going to say that some, some charter schools are bad schools, just like some traditional public schools are bad schools. I personally am pro good school, whatever that school is. That, I mean, that's that personally what I am. But charter schools are public schools. That is just a misnomer. That's misinformation. They are. I, you read the law that how charters come about. They are part of the public school foundation, period. They're not a traditional public school, but they are part of the public school system. If they weren't, they would be a private school and they could charge tuition and things of that nature. They're not. Every student in a charter school receives the same per pupil allowance, just like every other school does. They are public schools. That, that's just the reality of it. We may not like charter schools, or we may not like what some of them are doing. There are some charter schools that are doing absolutely fabulous things in this state, and there are a bunch that are not. And so I'm not speaking, I'm not singing a charter school's praises. Because I would, I have this same conversation when I stand in front of a charter school crowd. I, I'm not biased in any form or fashion. I'm gonna give you the straight up facts. So what we're gonna kind of talk about is what this new assessment means for your child, what your child can expect, ways to support your child, how to interpret test results, and additional resources for parents. So what do the new state tests mean for your child? We know that in Michigan, we adopted um, new academic standards in 2010, which were the Common Core State Standards. So the Common Core State Standards are more rigorous. They are um, a better set of standards that are preparing our students for the workplace as well as college. So we adopted those standards in 2010. The Michigan Department of Education, State Board of Education adopted this, um, the Common Core State Standards as our education standards. The Constitution, Michigan's Constitution, gives the State Board of Education that authority to do so. The Michigan Department of Education is in charge of implementing 
federal law implementing policy that the State Board of Education um, develops as well as any laws that the legislator, uh, legislature develops. So when, they, when we adopted Common Core State Standards in 2010, the State Board of, I mean, the Michigan Department of Education said we're going to give school districts to the 2014-15 school year to be prepared for this. So we adopted in June 2010, it did not become effective that every school district had to be teaching the Common Core State Standards. They had to start in the 2014-15 school year. We have school districts that began immediately preparing their teachers, and we have school districts who waited until the very last minute to prepare their teachers and their students, okay? So that was the thing about that. Um, we needed to change our standards here in Michigan. We needed to. Had anyone ever tried to pull up the GLICs before? Those were our old standards, grade level expectation content standards. Had anyone ever pulled them up? Each grade level was about a ream of paper. Literally, you would print a ream of paper. How was a teacher supposed to figure out what they're supposed to do in a classroom with a ream of paper of standards? So our standards covered um, they were a mile long and an inch deep. So our students were getting all of these topics and they were only covering the surface of the topics. They weren't, it was no in-depth. It was no really figuring out what the topic was and that's what Common Core did. It shrunk those standards. So instead of having uh, 75 standards that you were supposed to teach in 10th grade, now you have 20 standards that you're supposed to teach in, in uh, 10th grade. But you're going to take those 20 standards and instead of just going an inch deep, you're going to go a mile deep and really make sure that that student understands that. Our new state assessments are based off of Common Core State Standards, the new education standards. Okay. One of the bigger things, and I'm talking about Common Core just for a little bit because a lot of times people are so confused about the difference between a standard and curriculum. Does anybody know the difference between a standard and curriculum? No. So, uh, hold up. So, standards are what students should learn, and curriculum is how they learn it. Standards are what students should learn, and curriculum is how they learn it. So, the standard is, let me, everyone, does anybody watch football? Nobody. Sometimes. Okay, so I'm going to give you my great analogy for this. The NFL created the standard by saying that in order to get a first down, you have to go 10 yards. That's the standard. The standard is in order to get that first down, you have to go 10 yards. Curriculum is how you get there. So if they do a quarterback sneak, if they throw the ball, if they pass the ball, Whatever they do to get that first down is curriculum. So standards are what students should learn. Curriculum is how they learn it. That's the number one difference in what people don't understand the difference between standards and curriculum. Standards, the State Department, I mean the State Board of Education has the right to adopt standards. Curriculum is chosen locally by your local school board. The state nor the federal government has, does not have any control over your curriculum that's used in your school district. We're okay with that one? So these new statewide tests that we have are based off of the new Common Core state standards. So what happened? We took this test this year, right? We still don't know what the test scores are like because it didn't happen the way it should have happened. But I'm going to tell you what was supposed to happen, and then we'll have a conversation about what actually happened and how we can move forward to what should have happened. So students in grades 3 through 8 and 11 will take the new English language arts and mathematics test, which is the what we have is the M step. They replaced the meat. Everybody loved the meat, right? You loved it. Everyone loved the meat test, right? I so disagree with you. The meat test 
was a complete joke. The MEEP test didn't even test our students in the grade in which they were taking the test in. So when your students took the MEEP test in the third grade, they were really taking a test that was based off of what they learned in the second grade. They wouldn't get the test results back to the student was almost in the fourth grade. So how do you hold anybody accountable? Do you hold the second grade teacher accountable, the third grade teacher accountable, or the fourth grade teacher accountable? Oh, yeah. I know. I know. Oh no, I'm, the content of the, of the M-step is better than the MEEP, but I agree with you because I still sit on an assessment uh, co committee for the state and still have no idea what the test results look like. So I'm with you completely. I, I completely understand that. But the test for the, the, the actual content of the M-step is better than what the MEEP test was. The content is better. The MEEP test, for all intents and purposes, really did absolutely nothing for us. And outside of taking a month of school time away from our students, because what would happen is that they took that test in October. All of September, teachers did what? Go over stuff and try to get the kids ready to, and prepared to take that test. So our students really lost a month of education preparing for that test. So the MEEP, the M-STEP replaced the MEEP. So let me just give you some background about what happened. So when we adopted Common Core State Standards, we became a part of Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, which is there were two assessment consortiums that were put together uh, surrounding Common Core, Smarter Balanced and PARC. And what and who participated with that was ACT, SAT, all of the major education associations helped develop these tests. Okay, so Michigan was a leading state partner with Smarter Balance from 2010 through 2013. In 2013, our legislature attempted to um, stop us from using Common Core State Standards, and that didn't pass. So when that didn't pass, what they did was said, we won't fund a Smarter Balance assessment test. So they made the, the Michigan Department of Education put out an RFP for tests. So since 2010, the Michigan Department of Education had not updated the MEEP test because they knew that they would be a part of this Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. That's what they had been working with. So in 2013, the um, legislature said, no, you have to put this RFP out, and that's what Michigan Department of Education did. They put out an RFP saying what, what test falls in line with what we want to do. Of course, Smarter Balance was at the top of that again still, but our legislature said, no, you cannot use Smarter Balance because that was a part of their way of trying to stop us from having Common Core state standards. And so the, the politicalness of Common Core is what, what got us there. So honestly, all hell, all heck broke loose um, when our president of the United States, whether you like him, love him, or hate him, stood at a podium and said, I support it. I support Common Core state standards, and it, it went to H-E double hockey sticks. Um, that's when the political arena fell apart. Because when we adopted Common Core State Standards in June, there wasn't this many people in the room when the State Board of Education did that. The two times that they've tried to repeal it, we, there's been overflow rooms. I sat through 16 hours of testimony from people who none of them were from Michigan, one of them. The one, guy who called people said that the state was only coming to count the darkies at the school. Do y'all remember that? That was in the news. Anyway, so that was, that's what happened. So Michigan, I mean, the, the legislature said, no, you can't do smarter balance. So it left the Michigan Department of Education scrambling to try to figure out what am I supposed to do? What type of test am I supposed to give our students? Because we have to uh, assess. We have to assess because that's a federal law. We have to assess our students third through eighth and eleventh grade year. We have to. So the 
Michigan Department of Education created the M-STEP. The M-STEP is actually part of Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium because we had absolutely no time to do something different. With some components that's built in that Michigan Department of Education created. So some of it is, some of the test is I call MEET 2.0, and some of it is the, um, the Smarter Balance Assessment part. The problem that happened with the M-STEP this year is that they didn't implement it the way it was supposed to be implemented. It was supposed to be a computer adaptive test, and it was not a computer adaptive test. Our students took the test on the computer, but it was not computer adaptive. A computer adaptive test will ask you a question and you answer that question. If you get that question right, it'll ask you a, a slightly harder question because what it's doing is testing your growth. It's testing your knowledge of where exactly you are. If you get it wrong, it's gonna ask you a slightly lesser question to see where you are. That's why computer adaptive tests are so great because you can actually look at the growth and see where that student is and where they went. We didn't do that this year. And from what I understand, it won't be that way when they take the um, M-STEP again this year, unless we as parents and community really rile ourselves up to do something about that and say, you need to give our students the test that they deserve. They don't deserve to take MEET 2.0 if it's the same exact thing that they've always been doing. So that's part of it. So the computer adapter was supposed to be short answers, test is customized for each student. That was the great thing about the computer adaptive test is that in a classroom of 30 people at, a, at, at labs, every person sitting next to each other would not be answering the same question at the same exact time. So it, it stops the, uh, the, the idea of people, students cheating and things of that nature. Okay, That didn't happen. There was also supposed to be include performance tasks, and, the, and it did include performance tasks this year, and those were questions that would be multi-step questions. It may be an algebra, a algebra question that had multiple layers to it that a student had to literally write it out. Or it may be answering some um, short-term, you know, some paragraph-style questions that they would have to write out the, the, write out the um, answer. So if you heard recently that our state superintendent changed up what was happening, and one of the things that he changed with the M step for this upcoming school year is that a lot of the performance tasks will be eliminated in some grades. So the only people who will be doing the performance tasks are third, eighth, and 11th graders. All other classes, I mean, all other grade levels won't be doing the performance tasks. To shorten the time, yes, ma'am. The NWEA is a test that, that school districts voluntarily participate in. There is the state, Michigan Department of Education, every state education association has to administer a standardized test because that is what they're graded on through what's right now No Child Left Behind, which is before that it was ESEA. Federally, you have to administer a test. You have to have something, a same score, same cut score, you have to have a test that every school in your state is assessed on. What has happened in Michigan is because our state assessment, which was the MEEP test, was not providing the information that school districts needed, they began to, to tap into and sign into and, and, and go, go on board with other assessment tests throughout the year to get the information that they needed. So the only test that a student has to take from the state was the MEEP, and now it's the M-STEP. That's the only test that the state mandates. Any other test that your students are taking, it is because the local school district has made that decision that they want that information that's garnered from that particular test. So what has happened is that we have become so adapted in this individualized mode that everything has to be completely different that we, we've missed the forest for the trees. So every state feels like they have to develop their own instead of utilizing something because what could have happened is that the states that are using Smarter Balance or the states that are using PARC 
you can see the decrease in other state assessments that's being used because those assessments are garnering the information that the school districts want so they no longer are using those tiered level of assessments. Here in Michigan, because we're such a special group of people in our legislature, they don't see the, the, the need for that. So the NWEA test is a test that a separate group put the, I'm just being honest with you. It's because of separateness. It's because that we become territorial and say that we don't want them telling us how to test our students. I, I can just be honest. We're, we're, we're friends, right? I could just be honest here. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm a volunteer. Um, so uh, the, the reality of it is that sometimes what happens is that people's job security becomes more important than our children's success. And when you get to a point where people are saying, okay, now we're going to use something to, 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 evaluate you on there becomes an issue with that and, and sometimes you see a a, 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 a change up bless you sweetheart a change up with things I personally think anybody in any job should be evaluated I personally think that do I think that the legislature was the, gr the best group of people to create an educator evaluation system no how could they but so the test anxiety sometimes came along with the pressure because teachers themselves were worried about if these students don't pass this test, does that mean that I'm no longer going to have a job or I'm out the door? So that anxiety that they had translates down to our students. It, it shouldn't be that anxiety there. Stu teachers shouldn't feel like they're not going to have a job if their students don't pass a test. With the Smarter Balanced Assessment test, it had all of the parts of the test that all of our school districts are using anyway. But one of the things that it did was it, it kicked out professional development for teachers. So if students in this classroom didn't pass, you know, couldn't pass their multiplication tables, then it would kick out professional development for the teacher to say, hey, 50% of your students didn't pass this particular portion. There's some, these are some things that can help you better teach students, your students in your classroom. So I think as, as parents and community, if we fully understood what the test had to offer, if we fully understood what needs to happen, then we could better advocate for our kids. And sometimes, us advocating for our kids is going to be different than what the school district, what the Board of Education, and what teachers are saying. Sometimes that happens. We as parents and community are the only group of people who are speaking out on behalf of children unbiasedly. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with what any of our teacher groups are doing, any of our administrator groups are doing, any of our school board I mean, groups are doing. I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. However, all of those education groups, all of those groups have a specific person in mind. So teacher unions are fighting for teachers. School board administrators are fighting for school board members. Administrator groups are fighting for administrators and we as parents and community need to have that same type of fight for our kids sometimes we have to say i know that there's a t in pta however that p is first and we're always focused on our kids and again i'm not saying fight the school district because we have to work together but sometimes we need to make sure that what we're fighting for is actually what's best for students or what's best for everyone else. So what do the English test measure? Um, the first thing that it will measure is can students read? And that seems like that's very um, silly.
to have a test that the man monitor of kids can read. However, we have a bill in our legislature right now that's called the third grade reading bill that will penalize students if they can't read in the third grade and will, can hold them back for possibly up to two years and things of that nature. Does anybody know why third grade reading is so important? Across the country, why third grade reading is so important. <clears throat> one, third grade is the first year that you have to begin taking standardized tests. It's one. Two, prisons are um, built based off of third grade reading to scores, if you didn't know that. The other thing is that if a student can't read by third grade, their likelihood, they are three times more likely to drop out of high school. So reading by third grade is essential. It's absolutely essential. So that's why so much is placed on third grade reading. So when you hear all of that stuff about third grade reading, third grade reading, now you know why third grade reading is so important. For me, the bigger thing outside of the other things is that we should be we should be demanding that every student knows how to read. And it shouldn't even be a question that we're even still talking about. Do third graders know how to read or, or do we have kids in high school who know how to read? That is ridiculous that we're still having this conversation but we are. So one of the things is that that's the, the switch from going from a, a bubble test to going to a computer adaptive test is that you can actually garner that. With a bubble test, what we took before with the meet and even what we kind of did with the computer adaptive test, I mean not computer adaptive, but just taking the test online, is that if you have four questions, that's multiple choice, what's the percentage that you can guess and, and make the right answer? 25%, right? So 25% of the time, so you can have a student who passes a test, a bubble test, and they guess the entire test. Is that really what we want? Is that really what we want? Do we just want test scores that say, yes, our students pass this test, or do we really want to know that our students are learning what they're supposed to learn in class? And so this is what this is moving towards the 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 practice exams that I told you about that some of them are um, being eliminated this year is to write effectively that's a portion of students learning how to be able to be able to write if you talk to business owners if you talk to um, people who are hiring our students the number one complaint is that people don't know how to write they can't send an email they can't do basic they can't craft an email not that they can't send it but they can't craft a basic email. I don't know, I, I put something on my Facebook page the other day that I said I think that text messaging has eliminated people's ability to have conversations because everybody talks in this abbreviated and writes in this abbreviated stuff that I feel like I need a secret decoder to try to figure out what it actually means and can I like put a translation on my phone to figure out what it means so instead of you know, I'm just saying they just put IJS. Like, how do you supposed to know what that happens? But employers are talking about the fact that that's happening at work, that people are sending these this communication with this abbreviated speech as if it's correct. And so we need to be able to make sure that our students are able to write effectively, that they're able to listen effectively, and more importantly, research skills. When you, what do you do for a living, sir? You're a realtor. When you became, when you, you were studying for your real estate exam, right? What did they give you? Yeah. What did you, what did you study from? Study was it? So you had this literary text, or I mean, a literary text, or did you have a research text? So you had something that you had to go through and find the answer to. It wasn't Char It didn't read like Charlotte's Web, right? Okay. What do you do? Oh, all these realtors. Anybody that's not a realtor. Some of our students aren't even being taught how to look at the key terms or to look at, you know, to, to figure out, let me look at the definition, let me look at the index and see how we go back there. So that's what our tests are supposed to be testing our students on because that's what our standards should be teaching. That's what the teaching should be happening in the classroom. 
So we want to make sure that those that the computer adaptive test is what is happening. It didn't happen this year. And from what I'm understanding, it won't happen next year. I mean, this upcoming year. But we want a computer adaptive test. Has anybody taken the GMAT? The GMAT is a test that you have to take if you wanted to get your graduate degree. So if you want to go and get your graduate degree, you have to take the GMAT for most schools. And it's a computer adaptive test that asks you a question. If you get it or, you know, uh, answer it correct, it goes back and forth. That's what we need to move to. When you look at everything that's happening, it's about growth. Because if we only evaluate teachers based off of a test score, a test score really says, in my opinion, says absolutely nothing about that student. If all we base them on is a, a MEEP score or MSTEP score, it says absolutely nothing about that student and it says absolutely nothing about that teacher. So if I am in the third grade and I walk into your classroom and when you give me an assessment and you assess me and it says that I'm on a um, 1.7, which means that I'm at a first grade seven months in level, reading level. But when I leave out of your class and you test me again and I'm at a 2.8, meaning I'm at second grade eight months in, that is growth. That means that that teacher took this student from a 1.7 to a 2.8. No, they're not at four where they should be to walk into fourth grade, but that growth is there. We don't have the type of assessment right now that will show the growth. And until we get to that computer adaptive, until we get to that type of test, that's the only way we're gonna be able to show that growth. That's the only way I think that teachers should be evaluated by test scores. The, the state assessment does have built-in um, accommodations. So in a, in a situation where you have a student who has some anxiety with tests, the MSTEP has it, the MEEP had it, most state assessments have accommodations where you can sit down and have one-on-one -on -one and you can have someone read your student. They could read the student a test and get the answer from them that way. Those are those accommodations are in place. Do we utilize them? Not necessarily because most of the time parents don't know that they have those accommodations that they can request for their students. So what do the math test measure? It measures concepts and procedures. It measures problem solving strategies, models, or arguments. I love math, and one of the things that I hate with math tests is it only gives you this number. So you usually see two plus four equals, and then you pick six, eight, 12, or 13. Well, the thing about that is that if there's nothing in depth about it, how do we know if the student really understands that two plus four equals six? or did they just pick the right answer? So it, it's about doing a little bit more. And when we take away the practical part of the test, we're not getting that information. And so you don't know if they can fully solve the problem, I mean the problem, if they can um, build practical arguments about what's happening with what they need to know. The test should really be about, do they understand what they learned? Not just, did they get the right answer? And when you look at the MEEP test, what we had before, when you look at those things, it's just about the, can you get the right answer. It's not about can you identify what this student has learned. And that's what we really need to get to. So how long will a test take? So we know that was a colossal mess this school year. And it was because no one actually knew what was going on and how things are gonna happen. The test is supposed to, is estimated to take about seven to eight and a half hours in totality. They break the test out into small parts, into small groups. When they're taking computer adaptive tests, they say that a t um, Smarter Balance has said that a school of 600 kids could test with one computer lab of 30 computers, just depending upon how you do it. One to two hours per day. They really trying to switch from, I remember I graduated from high school. I went to Detroit Public Schools. I graduated from high school in 1996. So not that far, almost 20 years ago. But when we took the test, you literally, it was all day. Like you took this test all day long. Which they went all day, they should not have been going all day long. 
it, actually for anybody. It shouldn't have went all day long. Even ACT test is only four hours long. I mean, it shouldn't have been going all day long. It was just that there was so much confusion about what needed to happen. There was so much confusion about how long it was going to take that, that the state didn't give a whole lot of great information. And so school districts did the absolute best that they could to administer a test that they got very last minute, very last information, very much. Yes. It, it was, well, we talked, I mean, I talked to you a little bit about where the intimidation factor comes in at. But it was a lot of misinformation. It's the same thing that happens with um, standards or ESEA or NCLB, any of those things. People will, or even the Bible or what, you know, people interpret things their own way. And so we can all read the same, pull out a Bible, whatever, and read the same scripture, and we can all interpret it a different way. Instead of just looking at it and saying, this is what this actually says. And sometimes we slant what we see based off of our own perceptions. And so, in my personal opinion, this is Shatan Berry's opinion, not Michigan PTA's opinion, Shatan Berry's opinion, that with everything else that is going on in education, it completely tainted the assessment process. People, you know, you even have this thing about kids are assessed too much. Assessments have even received a bad term. You know, assessment is not a four-letter word. You are assessed every day. If a teacher asks a question in class, they're assessing whether that student knows that information. If you take a quiz, you're being assessed on that information. If you take a test, you're being assessed on that information. So assessment gets such a bad rap, and people get so wound up about this assessment thing. Assess oh, oh, we can't do the, you know, oh, we can't test students. Well, how else are you supposed to know where they're at if we don't test them? or assess them. We assess every day. Asking a, homework is an assessment. It's an assessment tool. It's assessing whether that student knows what they're doing. So you have to be leery of the buzzwords that you hear. And when you hear things like, uh, you know, students are assessed too much. It's the first time I hear someone say that, I always say, well, what do you mean by that? And, it's, and, and you can kind of tell that it's just a buzzword that's being said. I don't think that students are being necessarily being assessed too much. The manner in which they're being assessed may be too, too much. The pressure that's being placed on that assessment from adults may be too much. I don't necessarily think that students are being assessed too much. Yes. 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 I think that we can definitely do better with, with the way we assess. Assessing for growth is much better than assessing for a score. And until, until we, as parents and community, fight that fight, it's going to continue to be that way. You have to let your legislatures know. You have to talk to your school district, talk to your state, you know, state board members and things of that nature, saying, this is what we want. This is the type of assessment that we want for our students. Parents are the most powerful key stakeholder in any school district. It's not students. Believe it or not, the student is not the key stakeholder in a school district. I know that is like, whoa, what do you mean? It's the parents. Without parents, there would be no students for anyone to educate. So you are the key stakeholder. Your voice matters. If you choose not to use your voice, mm -hmm. well, what happens with opt-out? Opt-out affects your school funding. That, that, that's the part that the, the opt-out community doesn't talk about. They don't talk about what happens because your federal, a portion of our per pupil 
funding comes from the federal government. The federal government base, f passes out money based off of the number of students that were assessed. So when you, when you have people who opt out of the state assessment, then that affects the funding level for that school district. Good, bad, or indifferent. If people are okay with that, that's fine. But that's part of what happens with opting out. I, I, I'm not opposed e either way. I just need people to really understand what uh, opting out means and how it can affect your school district. Well, I mean, there was a, there was a, a push statewide for some people to opt out. So it, 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 it's not just what happens right here is what happens collectively. I don't think that the opt-out push was nearly as big as what they wanted it to be. Um, and you also, you, you should know that who pushed for opt-out was homeschool parents, who their kids don't take a test anyway or get any per-pupil funding. Just the reality. It's not just ELL students. It's not just ELL students that are being asked to stay at home. There are special education students that are being asked to stay at home. There are students who are low performers who are asked to stay at home. The reason why you have school districts and people who oppose growth, who oppose growth as a model, is because you can't hide growth, hide in a growth model. We have high performing school districts that have that their achievement gap between their low performers and their high performers are greater than a low performing school district because they hide their low performers. And so those school districts oppose a growth model because when you look at a growth model, it's going to expose what you're doing with your low performers. So if, if 80% of your students are high performers and they can pass all of these tests, you look great but you still have 20% of your students that you're not servicing. So if we don't go to a growth model, you can never really see those 20% of those students because they're hid. There's a complete difference when you have ELL and you have all of those places in place and when you can look at a balanced across the board approach. So when you look at a growth model, we looked at a growth model here in Dearborn or you looked at a growth model in Lansing where they have, I don't know, 80, 50, I think, languages that's spoken in, in, in Lansing School District. If you look in Detroit, where I think there's like 37 languages that's spoken at school district, if you looked at a growth model, you'll be able to actually be able to better assess what's happening with those students. ELL students are the number one reason why we should have a growth model because it's easier to be able to say, look at how this student is, 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 is growing and what they're learning versus just saying, take this standardized test and do you pass it or not. There are accommodations that are supposed to take place even with that test. For ELL students, for special education students, there are accommodations that are there. If you're not receiving those accommodations, if those students are not receiving those accommodations, that's the question, that's another voice that you all need to be to say, why aren't you doing the things that's supposed to happen for those students? There are accommodations that are in place that are supposed to help ELL students, that are supposed to help special education students. They are in place and they have them. The state has them. And they're supposed to be used. But if parents don't know that those accommodations are available, they don't know what to ask for. The system is never going to be perfect until we, until we as adults get past our own egos. And then when adults get past their own egos, and if everything is really about students, then we will have a perfect system. The number one thing is that you should not only be having conversations with your legislature when you legislator when you want something. You want to build a relationship. I cannot talk today. You want to build a relationship with your legislator because you want them to know that you care about everything. And so when you send that email, when you send that fax, they're going to pay attention to it. Believe it or not, a phone call from you 
equals 10. They, they, they multiply it by 10 because they figure that you've talked to at least 10 people. And so every email, every phone call, every fax that they receive, they view it as 10. The problem is, is that how many of us are actually doing that? Are letting people know what we think about, about that. When there is a hot bill in, in, in the legislature, I literally fax my legislator every single solitary day. I email them every day. I do not vote yes on this. We are counting on you to support kids. We, I will hope that when you go into session today, you are thinking about students when you vote for this. So, and it's okay to, it's okay to know who's on the education committee and voice your concerns through whatever that committee is. We send out, how many people are local unit presidents? So when you get the advocacy alerts and things like that, that Michigan PTA sends out, do you send them to everybody in your membership? You forward the email blast out? Okay. So right now what we're looking at is the um, open carry law, and we're going to be getting some information. Because there's really, everybody's talking about the one open carry law, but there's actually seven bills that's also attached to this. So it's bigger than just that one bill. And, and getting one bill down doesn't mean that the other seven are going to, you know, come back and help with that. So you'll be getting some information about that. But what we try to do is to make sure, as Michigan PTA, we send our opinion to or our position to every legislature on every issue that we have. Do we say this is what our position is? We put out the advocacy alerts hoping that our individual members will also contact um, their legislature. I'll give you a perfect example. In 2012, when the open carry law came about that time, I, I was still president of Michigan PTA, and I sent out an email that said, I want you to flood the governor's switchboard. Flood the governor's switchboard and tell him to veto this bill. And I solely say that Michigan PTA got that bill vetoed because we had 15,000 people calling the governor's office to the point where they were picking up the phone saying, he's going to veto the bill, please tell people to stop calling. But think about what we could do if we got every parent, even if you just got one parent in a family, if every mom or every dad called about an issue and flooded those lines, we have to educate people and get them to understand that their voice matters. And that's the problem that we have right now is that people don't think that their voice matters. We are stronger. We are better than any legislature that is in place. I don't care if they're pointing fingers at each other because we can go to the polls and vote their behind out. We have to do what's right for our students. We have to vote um, based off of people who support education and support what we want to see happen with our students. Our children are depending on us. We are failing them by not being the advocate that they need us to be. And what we have to get our parents to understand is that same advocacy that you use at the local school level that same advocacy that you use when you walk in that school and say, why isn't there any toilet paper in the bathroom is the same advocacy that we need to use when we call the governor and say, why aren't you vetoing this bill? Or we're making contact with our education, um, the education committee and saying, why aren't you doing this? We have to make advocacy just as important as fundraising and all of those other things that we do. It's very important that we do that. So. My, what I'm going to ask you to do, and as you continue to talk to people about this, is one, support a growth model. Support a growth model in education because there's going to be talks, there's so much that's tied to this when you think about what is color coding systems for, for schools or is it going to be an A through F grading level for schools or all of those things to identify schools. We want our schools to be identified by growth. We want our teachers to be evaluated on a growth model. We want to know exactly how our students are learning. That's what we want to know. We don't want to know if they, if 80% pad, you know, pick the right bubble on a test. 
We want to know how each one of our students are doing because it's we're setting our students up for failure. We're giving them a high school diploma and they walk into college and they're not prepared and they have to remediate and then they wind up dropping out because remediation, we spend a hundred billion dollars a year on remediation in Michigan. Okay, so a hundred billion dollars a year on remediation. So we need to make sure that that happens. And I'll tell you that when you sit down with um, colleges and they don't want remediation either. They really don't. When you get to, because the, no one's completing any degrees. They want people to complete degrees. They don't want people to drop in and take a couple of classes and, and go that way. They want them to complete degrees. Yeah, remediation is huge. It, 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 it's a huge factor, and it's the number one reason why students drop out of school, or right, or drop out of college. It's not, people always think it's the finances. It's not the finances. The remediation classes affect the finances, because if you have a, a, a scholarship or you have whatever, and you've got to spend most of it on remediation, that, but it's the remediation that helps. The parents aren't speaking up either, because what happens is that we get so in tune with what we think the school needs or what we think the school district needs or what we think the principal is going to say or what we think the superintendent is going to say that we begin to advocate for what they're advocating for. And we don't advocate for what we know is absolutely best for our students. And that's what it happens every day. It happens every single solitary day. And there's nothing wrong with supporting your school district. But there comes a time when we have to say, I'm supporting my child. And when you look at all of the controversy, you think of all of this controversy around a, a common standard and things of that nature, why? Why would you not want every child to be able to succeed? Why wouldn't you? It, 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 we have to work with our school district. We have to work with our administration to be successful. However, we have to vote, and we have to we have to keep um, the acronym. Lavonia came up with this acronym for kids. Keep it directed at students. So if you think about kids, keep it directed at students. If it's not about students, if it's not student focused, if it's not student centered, that's what we need to concentrate on. We know we may not be educators. That's okay. It's not my job to be an educator. It's your job to be an educator. But I'm telling you that this is the type of education that I want my child to receive. When my child walks out of high school, my child should be at this level of education. And so whatever you all have to do to get to this level of education is what I'm advocating for. No, I'm not telling you what you need to do. I'm telling you that when my child walks out of this 12th grade, they should be at this level. And I'm demanding that you make them at this level. And that's what we have to begin to say. We can't keep making excuses about there's not enough money, there's not those things, because there are areas that get less than per pupil funding than we do, and they're doing some fabulous things for their students. So at some point, we can't just keep fighting about school funding. We can't. We've got to change it and, and do something else. And so a lot of times I talk about, I don't talk an achievement gap. I think it's an expectations gap. I think it's what we expect our students to achieve. Because any child can learn and will learn if you set that expectation there. But if you don't set that expectation, then that's where the gap comes in at. So we just have to remember to use our voice for our pr most precious asset, which is our children. And make sure that the voice that you use is not anybody else's voice, but your own voice. Make sure it's a voice for students. Keep it directed at students. If it's not about students, think about it. If someone's coming to you with, oh, this and then that and then this and then that, say, what does this have to do with students? There's a lot of propaganda that's out there. 
It's a lot of propaganda about Common Core. There's a lot of propaganda about education reform. A lot. I read this stuff constantly because I'm just an education reform nerd. There's nothing wrong with being a nerd. I, I wear it proudly. But so if there's ever a question that you have, ever a hold on. If there's ever a question that you have, anything that has to do with education reform, if I don't know the answer to that or can't get it to you, I will make sure that I research it and give it to you. I want to make sure that parents are informed. I don't necessarily want you to think what I think. I want you to get the information and you make your honest decision yourself. I will tell you that I am a volunteer just like you are. I don't get paid from anyone to do any of this that I do. I left work to come here to talk. So I don't get paid from anyone. I support kids. And it doesn't matter whose kid it is, because I'm going to be honest with you, it's selfish. I'm selfish in a sense. Because I want to retire one day. And I'm going to need a doctor to go to. I'm going to need a, maybe need a lawyer to go to. I'm going to need a dentist to go to. I'm going to need a plumber to call, an electrician to call. And I want to make sure that we have those people in place to be able to do those things. And if we don't make sure that these babies have a great education, then that's our fault. It's our fault. And so we have to make sure. So when I think about, I have, you know, people say, do you have any kids? No, I don't have any kids. I didn't birth any kids, but I've got 2 million students in Michigan that I need to make sure receive a quality education every day. And that's what we should be about. So making sure every child receives a quality education, regardless of where they were born, where they live, what their socioeconomic status is, and what classroom they're in. That's their right, period. Only 21% of Michigan students are passing all four tests of the ACT. 21%. So what does that say? We get so ingrained and we get so caught up in, oh, we've always taken the ACT test. Or this SAT test doesn't look like this ACT test that we've always taken. But the reality of it is, is that our students aren't passing that either. So why not do something different? We have to not be afraid to try something different. The definite, um, Albert Einstein said the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing that you've been doing and expecting different results. We have been having our students take the ACT test for, I took the ACT 20 years ago to get in college. So you say for at least 20, thank you, 25 years of taking this test and even still, to, we still only have 21% of our students passing that test. We have to stop letting people tell us about, oh, this is such a bad test. Well, clearly, this is a bad test, too, that our students aren't able to assess. So we, we've got to change the conversation because this is the type of stuff that people, that they like to get parents riled up about. They like to give you... No, I'm not... I'm, I'm, when I say that, I'm out in far more communities than just Dearborn. I'm out across the state. And I will tell you that this is the kind of stuff that they use to get parents riled up about it. Because this is something that people can get a little bit of information about, and that's what they do. They'll say, look at this. Look at these numbers. Look at what, we, what ACT has done, and you get people to support that without necessarily knowing what exactly that is. That's why you have to be careful about the information that people are bringing to you. Even if you want to be careful about the information that I'm bringing to you, when you look at what I, any presentation that I do, I always provide where my source came from. So if you don't believe anything that I personally said, you can go and check exactly where it came from. Because that's the importance, that's the key of saying this is where it came from. We have to look at things differently. We have to look at education reform differently. We can't keep doing the same thing that we were doing 30 years ago. 
the United States has been on a decline in education since the 70s. The 70s. And we're still doing stuff the exact same way. Why? Because it's the way we've always done it. We have to change. Other, air, other countries, other places are doing something far more different. Um, when students know where they are, when and, and they know what they're striving towards, then it's great. When it's not a secret, when they become a partner in their education, when you sit down with the student, when you sit down with the family and say, this is where we need to go. Now, we're all partners in this education, and I don't feel like something's being done to me. I feel like we're in this together to make sure that my child succeeds. That's what we need. That's what we need. We need all pieces working together to make sure that that child succeeds. Thank you.